my talk today will be um, about more or less two things. The first bit is quite foundational in the old school sense of the term, which means it's concerned mostly with categories we use for thinking. In this particular case, about uh, for thinking about the neoliberal university. You can call this type of intellectual endeavor sociology of knowledge, social ontology. I may or may not have heard a slur in which it was once referred to as analytical philosophy. I prefer to think about it as the social life of concepts. And this is something that I anyway do. So I engage with the theoretical biography of concepts, including in this particular case, the Prospect of Neoliberal University. The other reason why I think that it's important to engage with um, a critical study of how we go about using different concepts is not only because I do it anyway, but because I think that this has obvious implications for practice. Now, I know that narratives that claim that if you want to understand this, you've got to read this, and this is then usually the sort of the most recent book that someone has written abound, and it's not my intention to add to these. So I'm not claiming that in order to understand neoliberalism in universities, you absolutely have to hear my obviously uh, brilliant analysis of how we think about these concepts. But I do think that thinking about concepts is something that happens when we talk about neoliberalism in universities anyway. Say, for instance, I was thinking actually of bringing up Brexit, but that's uh, perhaps an even too easy or too an obvious point to make. Say when we talk about vice chancellor's salaries, there was quite a bit of that in the news as of recently. So we, for instance, recognize that um, vice chancellor this and that has a salary of um, or has this amount of money paid to them monthly. So, and we react in a certain way, right? We say, this is really awful, but how do we explain this? It's not quite all right to say, well, it's because neoliberalism, because say, what if you were offered that sort of salary? Would you take it? <laughs> really? Do you think that that would make you neoliberal? Would that make you a neoliberal subject? Is that something you would be happy with? So when we say that someone is acting in a certain way, what are we actually saying? Now, I want to bring this up. So what, say, for instance, if that vice chancellor is a woman? How does gender play into this? Can we imagine it being the case? What if that woman is not white? Does race play a role in this? So what is it that actually acts and actually what is it that matters when we talk about neoliberalism in the academia? I want to bring this up because a lot of the current discussions that we have about neoliberalism, not only neoliberalism in the academia, as I mentioned, draw on this implicit ontology. Say, for instance, I will be bringing up this example throughout the talk. Uh, one of the things that have been mentioned uh, as of recently, not only within the academia, is sexual harassment. And one of the things that the right has managed to appropriate very easily is to say, well, okay, but if you're talking about the culture of harassment, <laughs> you're basically saying that somehow all men are um, automatically <coughs> engaged or that all men have something about them. So there's something about masculinity, right, that inclines them towards this sort of behavior, which then kind of gave rise to these... Um, sort of um, excuses along the lines of the hashtag not all men. And the thing that we don't understand in this particular context is that, or I think one of the things we need to engage with in this particular context is exactly this implicit ontology. Because we tend to think about that as if, or the framing assumes that it is something about masculinity as such, rather than something about power, relationships, and yes, among other things, neoliberalism in the academia that is conducive to this sort of behavior. So this is, for instance, why I think it's perfectly possible in the neoliberal academia to be a woman and engage in sexual harassment, to be someone whose politics are on the left side but who nevertheless exploits their junior staff, why it's possible to be an environmentalist and still fly around the world multiple times per month, uh, with sort of racking up a, uh, a massive carbon footprint and so on and so forth. 
But note that even when it comes to these cases, what we tend to say is, oh, well, you know, that one is not a real environmentalist, which means that we somehow invite this, um, or that we invite ontologies. Now, the primary category we use for thinking in the context of neoliberalism is obviously the neoliberal university. Now, a lot has been said and written about the neoliberal university, and it is not my intention to engage in either tracing the genealogy of the term uh, or thinking about what it can mean, but rather to try to think about what its components are. So what is it that exists, and what is it that acts in the university as we see today, which, is, um, which we tend to think about as neoliberal? And one of the reasons why I want to do this is because I think that neoliberal university has become a sort of diphthong, right? We tend to think about it as a construct, as a composite. And this is not only problematic, because there is a good meaning of the problematic in the sense of it's good for thinking about, uh, but entails in and of itself a theory of agency. But that theory of agency is not very explicit. Now, for those of you ontologically inclined, um, the ontological turn in social sciences and humanities, as I'm pretty sure you're aware of, is to a great degree concerned with populating or rather repopulating the world. So thinking about what is out there, right? But when we think, the only way we can know what is out there, uh, or rather I think one of the habits of thinking related to what is out there is by looking at how it acts. So, if we assume that reality itself is always to some degree unknowable, we see, we recognize things through their agency. So we perceive how they act in the world. Which means that we establish a link between reality and its manifestations, or rather reality and its empirical proxies. Now, at least in the classical sociology, the name we use for the felt or observed effects of objects on other objects is power. Much like the concept of field, this is something that we inherited or appropriated from physics. And critique, at least in its dominant form in the contemporary university, is still to a great degree associated with uh, what Latour has named the iconoclastic tendency to unmask the real face of power. So unmasking the reality that is behind uh, the interaction between different forms of objects. Now one of the things that I will be arguing is that what this type of exercise, critical exercise, <coughs> tends to do is to obliterate the sometimes human and possibly not always human agency of actors. So for instance, when we say that indicators, such as performance indicators, render something. We are establishing a link between two things. So we're saying on the one hand, there are performance indicators. On the other, there is an outcome that has to do with behavior or feeling or both. But we are actually not necessarily looking at what happens in between. In other words, we meant to say how things come to matter. Uh, so we end up issuing a theory of agency for an ontology and correspondingly by ontologizing concepts we usher in a theory of agency. I think that dealing with this relationship, as much as it might seem as a, an overtly theoretical enterprise, is relevant because I think it's technically impossible to conceive of change unless we actually think about how things interact or unless we render these theories of agency explicit. So by asking how matter comes to matter, among other things, and how power operates, we also make it possible to think of the future. And in the absence of this, the very talk of emergent properties, so the very talk about what can we do, including in the context of neoliberalism, remains futile, uh, as we have no way of thinking or knowing why things come together the way that they do. So why does a combination of certain elements produce certain outcomes and so on and so forth? We're reduced to either meekly observing them from the side, which has been the dominant um, strategy or response throughout different changes, including in the context of higher education in the past 20, 30 years, or being satisfied with statistical regularities. So saying, well, 
yes, we can see on the whole that this is shifting in this direction, but we're not really sure what to do about it. Worse, we get constantly surprised by our own incapacity to act. One of the things that I'm trying to answer is, how does this matter? So, how do we, can we actually have a theory of agency that allows us to understand um, what is it that, or how do the things come to matter, and in particular how they come to matter in the context of the neoliberal university? You might, I will also be arguing, in case, you know, to sort of, to uh, let the penny drop, that uh, what there is, <coughs> is not the same as what acts, and that these two are not the same as what matters. You might want to refer to this as, and I know that this is uh, putting very odd, um, odd elements or objects together, as a Rentian, perhaps slightly, I wouldn't say necessarily object-oriented, but slightly object-inflected social ontology. But um, that's a, um, that's just a, it, it's a way of framing it. It's not necessarily one that, it's, let's say that it's one that I'm testing, not necessarily one that I'm committed to. So Arendtian in the sense of commitment to practice, in the sense of commitment to the awareness that it's always with differently defined others that we have to live, including inhabit the institution that we can think about as the university and its environment, but slightly object inflected to the degree of perhaps recognizing that those <coughs> others do not always take the form of human others. So what I'll do today, and in line with the focus of this group as well as this event, is to investigate or look a bit into how different objects we tend to think about in the context of the neoliberal university, including but not limited to, say, academics, rankings, um, and, and so on and so forth. Um, so what they are, but also more importantly, what they do. Uh, and <coughs> The way I will spend the next, I think, 15 to 20 minutes or so is going through some of the dominant or influential critical renderings of the transformations in the contemporary academia and looking at how they frame these things. Now, uh, this will of necessity have to be because we have limitations of time and because um, I'm also trying to sort of use that in order to make a broader point. It will have to be a somewhat reductive and generalizing account. So um, do not necessarily hold me to my word in the sense of assuming that this is everything I think about uh, Marxism, Foucault, and object of, or, or new materialisms. It's not. All of these are, as I'm sure this particular room does not need to be told, very complex, variegated, etc., etc., uh, theoretical inclinations and ontologies in their own right. But I do think that they tend to converge when it comes to certain, certain elements of reading of uh, contemporary university practice, and this is what I will focus on. I will also be using a few illustrations. Um, they are again chosen from a very wide pool of texts on the transformation of higher education and research in the UK and beyond, and this is something also I've been looking at in the past two to five years. So there are many others, but these are perhaps illustrated. So this is, and yes, I've used, again, in line with the, uh, the digital identity of this event, I decided to use a clip art from the PowerPoint, Microsoft's PowerPoint program, exclusively in order to depict what's going on. So, and I think it's really, if you have ever, if you ever have some spare time, right, a lot of it, most academics don't, so I presume you don't either, but um, try importing quite a few of these and looking at what's out, so what's available within uh, different versions of PowerPoint, because I think it's really, really interesting. So, basically what happens here is we're assuming the main difference in Marxist readings of the university is obviously between those who own the means of production and those who work, so those who perform the work. Academics are usually defined as those people who perform the work, but sometimes there's something about students as well, so this is why this image here is a bit ambiguous. I'm not really sure who is here in the role of management, who is in, the, so you can see this relation between the human at the lectern and the 
uh, the ducks in the row is either the relationship between management and academics or the relationship between um, academics and students. I think it works in both contexts. Uh, the means, in that sense, are owned, well, in the context of public university, are in principle, if the university is public, are owned by everyone. But in principle, of course, this is, or at least in practice, this is not the case. So in the context of public funding, the government is uh, the primary actor who has the capacity to dispense uh, money, or rather allocate funding to universities. And in that sense, academics have a, uh, so they own their own means of production in terms of owning their intellectual capacity, but not necessarily the, the uh, results of their own labor. And that's increasingly, uh, we were talking just uh, during the break about lecture capture and uh, other forms of, um, of claiming property or laying claims on property of uh, intellectual or academic work. So I think it's a very interesting, interesting question what happens there. Um, now academics, of course, not all created equal. So not all academics are laborers in exactly the same sense of the term. Some of them are permanently employed, some of them are in relatively safe contracts, some of them are not these academics we tend to talk about as, or this phenomenon we tend to think about as precarity. So, but because political agency is primarily organized or expressed through one's identity as a laborer, we see this form of recognition. So we see permanent <coughs> employment, or uh, what used to be known as tenure, despite the fact that it has been abolished in the meantime. We see it, we still see it as recognition. So we tend to see that as an either in or out, right? And academics were somehow out by not achieving uh, or, you know, aspire, ma managing to achieve this tenure, somehow, you know, they're kind of moved <coughs> towards, we assume that they're moved towards the rubbish bin. So it's either you're in or you're out. That's it. And because of this emphasis on labor or identity as a laborer, as a form of political agency, we tend to completely ignore what happens, first of all, what happens on the side. And second of all, and this is where digital technologies become particularly pertinent, the amounts of labor that are not recognized as contributing towards permanent employment. Now, where digital labor is relevant there is one obvious um, example, I think Mark will probably be talking about that much more, is engagement th not only through social media, but also through different forms of digital platforms with the so-called outside, so with the world outside of the university. This has to some degree become captured through the notion of impact, which is in and of itself also a relatively ambiguous uh, policy instrument. But then again, this is the sort of work that is mostly performed by younger and precarious academics. The other type of work, the other type of digital, though not only digital labor, relates to the very labor, for instance, typing up lecture notes, which is also something we've been discussing um, during the break, emailing and so on and so forth. So maintaining communication, which is always mediated through digital devices, most of which, again, not as a rule, I'm not denying that everyone has a lot of emails to answer, write, etc., etc., is performed by academics who are not necessarily in permanent contract. Now, the fact that um, the management or the owner, whoever the actual owner of the university is, can capture this type of surplus, uh, surplus labor, surplus value, means that certain forms of labor are constantly becoming devalued. Teaching is one of them. TEF was presumably meant to redistribute value awarded to teaching. But whether it actually managed to do that or not is a different um, is a different story, a different question. I think we're all inclined towards claiming that it did not. Uh, but it also renders specific forms of labor completely invisible. For instance, care labor, and again, uh, feminist scholars of the academia have mentioned this more on multiple occasions. Now, if we move on towards and this, the Marxist readings of, um, of whatever goes on in the neoliberal university 
have also been there for quite some time now and they've changed with the introduction of specific, well first of all with the changes in the funding mechanisms, so with the privatization of higher education and Foucault, well Foucauldian, Foucault inspired uh, critiques became more prominent. Now for Foucault, the whole university or for Foucauldian inspired analysis, the university is defined as a site of surveillance. So these um, products of writing that you can see up there are policies that, and documents that somehow mediate power, usually through well, usually governmental power. So policies are, the, are those instruments that actually define what's going to happen in the neoliberal university. Academics and everyone else, so all academics, no matter the difference, are almost, well, enclosed as pigs in the same pen. They are surveyed, that's a video camera, at least that's what the clip art identifier says. <laughs> Their value is constantly being calculated and recalculated. Everything they produce, everything we produce, is being calculated and recalculated. And throughout that, um, or throughout that runs a line that's always, there's always a threat of being somehow sold. So not rubbished, as in necessarily, as in the Marxist analysis where it's the question of permanent employment or non-existence, but being sold. So the value of uh, whoever acts in this particular form of university being liquefied, so reinserted into the market, which is the governing principle of this type of university. Now, the problem with this type of uh, account mm -hmm. is the fact that political agency has to be somehow exercised through trying to hide from surveillance. So, it's the rise of mimicry. So, academics, well, which I think is something that all of us do one way or another, we say, well, we don't really believe in this, but we kind of go along. So, we pretend that this is, you know, our souls remain, or whatever else, or whatever other concept you might prefer remains intact, but we are pretending, we're, we're just playing along, or gaming the system, that's another uh, thing that, uh, that tends to go on quite a lot. But what this leads to is that, first of all, there is an assumption of the sort of flattening out of hierarchies, not only between academics and the management, because the management is somehow seen as the conveyor of this um, constant process of surveillance, but also uh, between academics or among academics themselves. And here again, we encounter the example of sexual harassment, because under the assumption that we're constantly being watched, which is we as a university, we as everyone who is inside the university, we produce an assumption that whatever happens within the ranks, so whatever happens within the pig pen, needs to remain within the pig pen, lest we get sold. And again, I'm not saying that this is what creates the culture of sexual harassment, very far from that, and other forms of exploitation in the academia, again, very far from that, but it contributes to stifling dissent. It contributes to saying, well, you know, Let's not make waves for the time being because we are constantly under surveillance, our existence, and mind you, this is where the ontological, or well, ontology comes in, uh, again, time and again. Our, you know, our very existence is under threat. The university is at its deathbed, and so on and so forth. We need to be careful about what we're doing. And this is one of the examples of how the political agency of academic staff is uh, rendered or described as a form of mimicry. So you have to hide. Now one of the, one of the issues with, uh, with this type of framing, I think, also has to do with, because uh, it has to do with the fact that it uh, reinforces, I think unwittingly, the emphasis on being seen. 
Now, Sarah Ahmed, for instance, has written a lot about this within the academia, so what being seen and, being, and or being invisible means and in what context, especially in relation to persons of color, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But I think it does sort of push the onus towards the visual. So someone is watching us, someone is always watching, right? Uh, and what we need to do is make sure that whatever goes on, desirable or not, remains invisible. Onwards to um, well, one of my favorite paradigms, which, and this is again, this is grouping a lot of work on universities under this work. <coughs> Um, assigning it the brand or the label of new materialist ontology, not all of that I think would necessarily happily subscribe to, um, to the label, but I think that the way for instance in which metrics, indicators and other assemblages are framed within, uh, within this type of work fits the, fits the bill neatly. Again, new materialism is, and I know you had you were you gave a talk, I think, um, exactly. Well, probably not in this very room, but you had a yeah, talk. With, yeah, exactly. Well, on new materialism, relatively recently. So, as uh, as I'm sure all of you or most of you know, it's again a very sort of an umbrella term for a whole series of approaches, not all of which necessarily talk to each other or converge about on a lot of points. But again, as I said my account will of necessity be somewhat generalizing. And this is not so, th th this is intentionally rendered like this because we're talking about <coughs> assemblages of bodies. So, you know, some of these, um, the Foucauldian pigs are, in a manner of speaking, out of the pen, but they're out of the pen because by now, there is no need to have the actual pen because everything is imbricated by, interpenetrated by different forms of algorithms which not only measure but also capture and influence how we act and some of these actors within the neoliberal academia at least as rendered by new materialism are also so, so they're kind of they've morphed in a manner of speaking with some of these uh, some of these algorithms some of these forms of digital devices um, this type of rendition is actually not that new in the context of studies of higher education, in part because the introduction of metrics has been felt very viscerally in the academia. So uh, Roger Barrows here, for instance, describes how metrics act. So not only how they are used, but rather what they create. 